In this interview, I am once again joined by Anthony Metivier, author and internationally renowned memory expert, whose meditation practice is reciting sacred Sanskrit texts from memory. Anthony takes us on a journey through the memory techniques that enable him to memorize hours of material in a variety of languages, including Sanskrit texts such as the Ribu Gita, swathes of Shakespeare, and detailed facts and figures. Anthony demonstrates his use of the memory palace technique, pulls back the curtain on the art of space repetition, and recounts the life of 16th century hermetic occultist and memory master Giordano Bruno. Anthony also reveals how he used memory techniques to face severe childhood trauma, to untangle a pattern of generational rage, and reflects on subjects such as non-duality, radical honesty, and consciousness. So without further ado, Anthony Mativier. Anthony Mativier, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Always good to see you, Steve. Well, I'm so delighted to be talking with you again, and this is our third episode. For this episode, we had an idea to go deeper into your memory techniques. In the last two episodes, as I mentioned, we did discuss your meditational approach of memorizing and chanting a Sanskrit texts such as the Ribu Gita. Mm. And how do you do that? Of course, you're internationally renowned as a memory expert and trainer. Perhaps we can begin there. Is there anything you want to say about, about memory in general um, or, and about memorizing Sanskrit in particular? I know that we, we planned that you would take us through a little bit how it is you memorize these Sanskrit verses. What is the, the process that you go through? And then, of course, many more questions after that. Well, I would say something. You said your memory techniques. And that I find we should pause upon. Not, it's, not, it's not necessarily incorrect, but these techniques are, are, are something that our species has cooked up or reality has cooked up through our species, however you want to look at some, something like that. But uh, David Berglis, he said something that always stuck with me in a book called A Question of Memory. And he said that everybody interprets the traditional wisdom in their own way. And he's a nemonist. And that maps onto something Giordano Bruno said. And I know Martin Fox has been on your show before. And I think Bruno has come up with him, the great Renaissance memory master and astronomer and mathematician to a certain extent. And I would call proto-information scientist. Um he said that anybody who thinks long and hard about these techniques or long and hard enough about these techniques, they will come to the exact same conclusion as anybody else would. And I think that part of what, what he's getting at there in his proto-information theory is that it, 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 everybody has a brain and every brain interacts more or less, you know, barring traumatic brain injury, barring some sort of congenital issue, et cetera. Everyone's brain re interacts more or less the same and information is more or less the same. And we just, these techniques have evolved. So they're not really mine. And, you know, I think of Tyson Yonkaporta also, who in Sand Talk, he talks about the Aboriginal memory techniques. And he says that people like me are the custodian of the techniques, which is, uh, I think, very, very important uh, that it's not owned by anybody. Uh, certain people have tried to trademark certain terms and all that kind of stuff. And I think that that's sort of missing the mark. Uh, the, these are uh, something our species has been gifted with, or however you want to frame it, it's evolved. That's very interesting indeed. And when you survey the various different memory traditions of the great and diverse cultures of the world, do you notice similarities? Are there particular uh, specialties, if you like, or particular unique characteristics of certain memory traditions over others? Or are there shared uh, factors and techniques? Yeah, that's a hard question to answer because obviously we want to say, yes, that's that's unique. That emerged in that place, in that way. And perhaps the people in a particular region might want to claim that as being special and unique. And I wouldn't uh, say anything to to uh, rob them of that, that special ego-driven <laughs> need, if I can put it that way. Uh, but the... 
the commonality is the same. And Tyson Young Caporta has said this. One of the things that we did when I when I talked to him on my podcast was, you know, how are we going to solve this battle that anybody owns these techniques? Because there was some controversy at that time that a particular group's techniques were better than the memory palace. And I was like, well, hang on. How are they different than the memory palace? It's space that is being, as scientists call it, elaboratively encoded with imagery, associations, sounds, and so forth. But by the same token, there are techniques that Tyson Yonka Porta talks about, and he said these are to be talked about by these people, and they may involve Lucasa, which are sort of wooden memory boards that have particular functions and beads on them. But nonetheless, it's hard for me as a person who doesn't see division and just sees unity <laughs> to say, okay, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's so different. When really all I see is space being elaborated with associations in co combination with the human brain, insofar as there is a human, you know. But again, that's like a categorical thing. And then the human brain is using that to recall something. Right. So it's both unique and not unique at the same time. Hmm. Uh, and, and I think we have to be the custodians uh, of that very human need to to feel unique, but also see the universal in it at the same time. And science has a hard time with this right now. It's 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 almost a, a, a strange period that we're going through, which reminds me a lot of Giordano Bruno and the hot water he got himself in because. He said things the way he said them, and he wouldn't recant, and that didn't end well for him. Um, but in any case, he said the same thing. It's like space, take some associations, weave them, and then when you need to recall that information, you think about it, that space, and then it comes back. I wonder if you might be a little more specific about what happened to Bruno and why this current period reminds you of his time. Mm. Well, his story is quite elaborate, and I'll try to just give the broad strokes. But he's born, they think, 1548, not entirely sure, in Nola. So he's sometimes called the Nolan. This is in Italy. He's a Dominican monk, I believe. And at one point in his studies, he gets caught with Erasmus, which I assume is praise of folly that he gets caught with. And he may have been hiding it in the toilet. Who knows? But nonetheless, they they find it in the toilet, according to the, the history records, and they know it's his because they can recognize his handwriting. What he wrote there, I don't know. Anyway, he's out of the monastery or whatever he was, and he is now basically a wandering Jew for most of his career. And he has an argument with Aristotle over logic, essentially, and he winds up getting into a lot of hot water over that because – he points out, and people didn't like this, but he pointed out that Aristotle admitted that the law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, and the law of the excluded middle, they basically have a big old Achilles heel in them, right? Which is that they're self-referential. They, they, they fall apart because they have to refer to themselves and logic only ever affirms logical rules, right? Uh, whether that's true or not, I, I'm not making statements, but that's, that's the intellectual noodling that goes on. So now come ahead sometime. He's writing books about memory. He's writing books about astronomy. He's worked out in his mind the idea that infinity must extend itself throughout the universe. And if that's the case, then there's probably infinite planets and there's probably infinite gods that are somehow working these planets into reality and so forth. And there's a kind of, I read it as a kind of real strong non duality where. Like if you read his court documents, because eventually they get hold of him and they say, you can't be saying this stuff. Galileo was saying similar things and Galileo was, navigated this much better than Bruno. But they, they drag him to Rome uh, and they work with him, I think, tw 11 or 12 years he's in prison. And they're, they're really giving him every chance to recant. And if you read the trial documents, he breaks down sometimes. But really, more or less, he's holding to this line and he's trying to get them to see that by their own logic, if there is a God, he ain't separate from us. In fact, there's a unity and the very principle of 
if you can get out of this Aristotelian thing that Aristotle himself said has a big chink in its own armor, if you can get out of that, you will discover that there is only this and nothing else, nothing outside of this. Like it's non-duality 101 as far as I interpret it. And I, I realize I may be making the Bruno that I want, but nonetheless, <laughs> uh, they drag him to the stake. And apparently, I mean, there's different versions of the story, but apparently, you know, they seize his mouth shut so he can't say anything about what's happening to him. And he's burned on February 17th of 1600. So he becomes a symbol to different people for different things. But his memory techniques, oddly enough, he talks about a great reverence for Aristotle because he basically is taking Aristotle's memory techniques to the next level. Also, Ramon Lowell's memory wheels which has a, another element to it called Ars Combinatoria, or the art of combination, which has to do with really why we have computers today. A lot of people attribute this to Ramon Lull, computation, computational thinking. It's kind of almost like the circle of fifths in music in a way where you can use these mental associations to work out the order of things. And he also is very much a, a figure of science, like true science as I would call it, if I can be so bold, that we have hypothetical statements that we make about the world, and then we bring evidence to confirm or deny the validity of the statements that we've made. And if we can stick to that, he seems to say, then we're going to have many, many glorious things happen. But we start getting on dogma, you start to say, well, you get to have it your way and you get to have it your way and all this sort of stuff. Then basically when they said they were going to take him to the stake, he said, I think you're more afraid of that decision than I am <laughs> because the implications of dogma are, are just a world not worth living in. And I, I, in a way, I think he gave up because you know, they, they weren't going to see things the way that he wanted or that he was convicted uh, was true. And he had a history of actually giving up. He was in Germany at one point having arguments about Aristotle and he abandoned the lecture. Then he, they came, they got him to come back the next day, but he had a student of his speak for him <laughs> and that student couldn't convince them. So then they both left and they left under duress of being stoned, beaten to death by the mob you know, because they didn't like his arguments uh, against Aristotle. So he had given up before. And I, I think he was just really tired of, of, of saying something that we now, many of us just accept. It. Of course, science is making hypothetical statements and then having actual evidence that confirms and denies it. But I tie it to this time because we are very much in a time where it's just like, oh, well, that evidence it wasn't on this TV station, so it can't be true. <laughs> You know, <laughs> it has to be on this TV station in order to be real evidence. And this is a very strange thing that that has evolved and emerged. But has it evolved or, and emerged or is it really just been going on all along, you know, eh, wherever there is corporate media and whatever precedes corporate media, there's another version of it known as the sovereignty of kings or what have you. Right. So is it really new or is it just another version that's built out of itself and seems to get more big and extreme. So I see him as a real symbol of, of not an answer, but a question. What do we do? Do we save our skin and recant? Do we fight harder knowing that we might be dragged off uh, to the pit or to the stake or wherever? What do we do? I don't think there's any answer, but he's definitely a symbol of this is what science is. And memory is tied into it because you either remember something or you don't. And there's different flavors of that. But at the end of the day, you either remember it or you don't. And I think he also got in hot water because even when he was in prison for years and years and years, that mind of his just reading the court documents, he was super sharp and he was reciting matters of doctrine and science and everything under the sun in in ways that I think just made people's jaws drop because of the clarity and pro probably the speed of it. Uh, but I don't know. I, I'm, I'm half imagining that. So I, I think he's a symbol of so many things. Wit, stubborn, um, just being totally with 
what he saw as the truth, but defining truth as an emergent property that requires constant testing. You know, I've heard some comparisons to aspects of the times in which we live with previous times. Uh, and I've heard comparisons with different times and for different reasons. You know? And I've also heard the argument that, well, civilizations are cyclical. I'm, I'm not making a particularly profound point here. I think everyone has heard this. this oh, civilizations are cyclical. They have a life cycle, this, that, and the other. When you look around, do you see other uh, similarities between Bruno's time and this time? Do you, do you hold to this idea of life cycle of civilizations? Uh, do you have any sense of where we might be at in the world today? don't really. And I find those things troubling. Because, you know, it, it, it leads off into what, what, what sometimes people call deepities. So Daniel Dennett, he didn't create this term, but Daniel Dennett, like, or he, I don't even know he's active anymore, but uh, he seems to have disappeared from the internet. But he used to say, well, that's a deepity. And that means, you know, here's this, like, so, so yeah, uh, you know, history repeats itself. Like with any thinking it's just like well history how can history repeat itself i mean it, this this is a thing that humans do and you know those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it well those who know their history also are doomed to repeat it so it's just a deepity it's like it sounds deep and profound but it isn't oh things go in cycles well yeah maybe they do or not but when we investigate it like where does the cycle begin and you know where are we in the cycle these are all mental metaphors that are just kind of like brain candy now, I admit that anything that I have to say is also brain candy. So don't, you know, if you're listening to this, I'm, I'm not pointing my fingers at anybody and I'll point them at myself as soon as I can. Because if I if I behold myself to what I've read in Advaita, if I hold myself to what I think is in Bruno, like it's, or in Nietzsche for that matter, um, in, Nietzsche mentions Bruno actually in a, in a very interesting way in the context of Spinoza. And Spinoza had similar sort of ideas of pure becoming and and no separation, total non-duality. Uh, and if we were to really be orthodox about that, which I I see it as a kind of a metaphorical truth because I don't know, but if I am beholden to this, a, a, a strict orthodox, extreme pure imminent non-duality, all that stuff is just appearing, and whether it connects to the Renaissance or Elizabethan stuff or whatever, where would it connect other than right here, right now, right? Even block time theory, I think, I mean, I'm not a physicist, so again, it's like point my finger back at myself as, as being deep and deepity like but, um, you know, block time theory, as I understand it, if all that would suggest that all things are all here, all right now, because block time theory says that the past is still there, the present is or is here now but it's the future is already there and something about the present is a production of itself right and again that may be totally misunderstanding it but it also leads to just the deepity oh wow all of reality is producing itself out of itself and then this is like what do you do with that you could read spinoza until you're blue in the face and be like oh yeah you know god or nature yeah or you know all those cool words that he uses all those cool phrases everything everything that nietzsche says super deep right but it's ultimately just appearing right here right now and if you get a little brain candy buzz out of it cool if it frustrate you you know you got other options you got cycles you've got uh this that and the other thing to play with but does it change anything i mean at the end of the victorious mind that's the question i ask if it's true what changes if it isn't true what changes if the answer is nothing then you know so i don't i don't really but i i, I like to really play around with that idea that reality is a production of itself. And I find that much more rewarding to draw conclusions out of, I think Shakespeare drew that conclusion also. Um, so you turned me on to Julius Caesar. And if we think about the relationship between things, all I'm thinking about when I was reading, I have only read half of it so far, but all I'm thinking about is like, wow, this sounds like the way the White House is represented right now in America. You know, um, all these backhanded games and people intending that this person is is going to become a tyrant or they're already a tyrant so you know let's all get together against him and then 
you know, you got the Anthony figure who's who's going to try to navigate all this and then get a, another crowd against them. It's just like crowd after crowd after crowd building upon thing after thing after thing that's happening as power and sovereignty wants to have some sort of control. William S. Burroughs said, probably probably said it best out of all that I've ever read, control seeks to control control. And that is like pure imminence in the sense of reality building itself out of itself. The story, if there is a history, is just a constant, this is responding to that. And that's Spinoza 101, cause and effect. Yes, indeed. I think a more charitable reading of of the of the of saying that those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it is I think of myself in my own life. Maybe I'm actually a terrible example of this. <laughs> <laughs> but I get the sense that occasionally I've learned from my past. Mm. And occasionally the memory of of a mistake with sufficient psycho emotional resonance is enough to um comes to my mind at certain times and appears at least to compete with whatever else in my being might be going down path a to say you know path a path a yes but remember ah yes i remember now we're back to memory perhaps but a body my memory as much as anything else and now not always is that uh better angel sufficient of course but sometimes mm. sometimes or at least for a brief time <laughs> <laughs> I'm diverted well, yeah, that, from my folly. That's uh, interesting. And, you know, there's another philosopher, Berson, who wrote Matter and Memory. And in, in his argument, all of reality is essentially an image. And his definition of memory is where matter meets the mind. And if everything's an image, then really, are you learning or is it the Spinoza cause and effect? So, this thing comes up, where did it come from? Well, it came from some sort of matter, so to speak, because that previous experience, insofar as reality is material, which certainly appears to be to me, you know, some part of it, uh, would have happened, it would have met your brain. Then, for whatever reason, it comes up again. You know, we don't know all the causes that causes it to come up, but if if memory has met with matter, then you know it, it, it just came up, and I don't think there's necessarily anything metaphysical about it. It, 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 it. It's coming up because of the engines of memory. So there's procedural memory, there's episodic memory, there's figural memory, there's autobiographical memory. I go you know through this whole list, and you know this is this is basically a, a science that has come to be not nearly as well understood as anyone would like, but insofar as what we see and what are our, our hypotheses and the evidence that we use to 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 arrive at conclusions tells us is that there are these different aspects to memory it's not one thing and there's a lot of mystery to it but there does seem to be a cause and effect and so implicit memory when you're younger it does a, according to these theories does a lot to shape how you would react later when new stimulation comes in that causes choice, for example. And so you have the illusion that you're making a choice, but it's all too often dictated by, or if not always dictated by a chain of causes and, and then effects. And, 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 you know, it's quite rhizomatic. It's not necessarily like a tree where, you know, the apple falls and hits the ground. It's like this, a lot of underground networks that aren't necessarily connected in, in a physical sense. We have neurons and the synapses pass signals they're, they're they're not necessarily coupled they're not necessarily even touching but in other cases they are touching they have dendritic spines and these myelin sheaths that wrap around it's very much like a garden in the brain and it operates like gardens you treat a garden a particular way you're going to get a particular effect you treat it another way you're going to get another effect could you say something about something more perhaps uh, an example of the role of implicit memory in in youth, in, sh in childhood or so, in shaping the way one reacts or responds or apparently responds and reacts to, to later choice? Well, in the, I mean, this is a sort of a darker example, but in the last five, six years, a lot of implicit research, implicit memory research has been done to try to work out why people 
some people harm, self-harm, suicide, all that sort of stuff. And there's been quite a lot of, of that related to implicit memory. So what that means essentially, like it, it, implicit memory is when you're just absorbing things and you're learning them uh, without even necessarily being cognitive of it, without necessarily being aware of it and so forth. And then how exactly that translates into behaviors later is not necessarily well understood, but as they're tracking people throughout their lives and so forth, they're, it, it's just sort of learned on autopilot. And I can see it in my own life. I mean, I am so in so many ways, I, I know I am my father. And it's the spookiest thing. It's like being haunted by, by something I know I'm not, but yet it's there. Uh, and I've done and a lot of the Sanskrit memorization has helped clear that out or clean it out. But nonetheless, it's still a, a, a specter, so to speak, of, of things that I have observed. And it okay. becomes procedural. <laughs> it becomes procedural. Now I'm curious. Could you say something about the specter of your father? Sure. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll maybe be a little bit muted, muted about it because he's not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> one of my recent books that I released when I originally wrote it at the last minute, I was reading it again before I released it. And I was like, we got to cut this stuff out. The guy's not dead yet. We don't want to be saying this, but um, he used to have a lot of, he was, he was an alcoholic for most of his life. He's mercifully figured a way out of that in his late sixties and early seventies. But uh, we had insane situations where he'd just be, totally nuts uh you know he he once picked me off the ground and slammed me into the glass uh, patio window didn't break it fortunately and i had to like punch him in the face but he's so drunk and so on all kinds of pills and whatnot that he can't feel anything and the whole thing had to do with you know my long hair and i don't know what i did or said but he was like if i ever find out you're gay i will kill you and he didn't say it in exactly that way but you know, that was the thing. And I, I don't even know what, what, what uh, insinuated that, but nonetheless, that kind of rage response to things, irrational things. That's, a, that's what I shared in my TEDx talk. I was like, yeah, when, before I went and had my first experience of non-duality, I was about to throw my laptop off the balcony, probably after jumping up and down on it. And throughout my life, I've had this like destructive urge to just destroy things. And I even have at certain points destroyed things. Uh, I used to have this bad habit that I know I learned from my dad. I didn't realize it at the time that I'd learned it from my dad, but I used to like get so angry at things. I would punch cassette tapes and like all my cassette tapes were, were, were destroyed. And then it would cut into the, the, the beautiful artwork that those artwork uh, cover artists spent so much time on. And, you know, I would mourn all of this. And it's only later in life is like, where would I ever have learned such a thing? Like, why would why would this meat unit have so much rage? And it's just because I saw it all the time. I saw things being thrown around. Yeah, I, I saw uh, my dad's not Pete Townsend, but he just would destroy a guitar out of nothing for no for no reason. Now he himself, if he tells stories of his life, he he was raised in uh, Quebec, what back when it was ruled by the catholics there was no government as such no agencies he wasn't even raised he was just dropped off at some crazy alcoholics house and they thought it was cool to get him drunk when he's six or seven and give him a cigar and they would also have you know conniptions and he he himself saw it so it's cause and effect chain that just goes on and on and on but i've become mercifully clear of it which is great I wonder if you might detail some of that clearing process. You said that the memorization of Sanskrit was key in that, and presumably mm. becoming aware of some of these things. It, it seems yeah. to have been an important part of it as well. Yeah, I. Uh, it really dawned on me during the whole Sanskrit, where I was really heavy on the, the four major pieces that I memorized, that I, I still had work to do. And one thing that I memorized is sometimes called Atma Shatakam, sometimes called Nirvana Shatakam. And the instant that I saw what it said, I knew which house I had to use as the memory palace. Because back to my dad, he had for a couple of years, this, this girlfriend and oh, man, 
the the nightmare of that place was just extraordinary and you know this episodes like this but even worse because she was very strange <laughs> and uh so i thought i have to use that house to clear it out because even even after memorizing some sanskrit and stuff like this and feeling so much better if i thought of that that person and that time and that place i would just start to get this you know very sad or very angry feeling or whatnot so i memorized nirvana shatakam in that place and such extraordinary peace resulted and i can actually think of that person with with, well, with nothing like it's just <laughs> you know i was going to say with charity but there's there's actually just i mean it's not nothing it is it's not meta it, it's it, it, but whatever it is it's not this irrational anger blaming should have been different kind of feeling it's just that's what it was you know uh, and i don't even think about it so that's a, a beautiful thing yes indeed were there moments of release or bursting of bubbles of of submerged caches of of this stuff or did it creep up on you and you just and you noticed at some point a reduction and presumably now a, a purification or whatever of that stuff uh, it's almost maybe a, a bit of both uh i i don't know that there's ever been anything that i've experienced that's super sudden although it some things feel sudden when they start to happen so you know it, it it's gradual and, and sudden at the same time in yeah, bubbles, bubbling is, is kind of an, a, a neat way of thinking about it and maybe a, a correct way. I have this pet theory that I don't have, you know, CAT scan machines or uh, MRI machines to, to, I don't have the budget to rent them and, and try experiments with people. But I have this, this idea that there must be, like the way that memory works, the brain takes things in, it just, it basically splits it up. And it stores it throughout multiple parts of the of the brain. At least that's what our theory has. And I, I wonder if if the content is toxic somehow, if it isn't somehow detoxed, then when we think about procedural memory and these automatic processes, you know, then that toxicity makes something about the way we we navigate the world also have that toxic edge. So if we can somehow detox it through maybe not erasing anything because i don't think i've erased any of these memories but just become just detox them i guess i, I mean I, I i see the limits of my own theorization and that would be a mental model one way or the other of thinking about a thing but positive and negative charges uh maybe de-static you know the way you take static out of a, a sweater or or whatnot uh you know you know these these kinds of ways that things get charged and then how do you dispel that energy and i think this is probably a, a way of doing that i just don't know how to test it or, or or provide evidence for the hypothesis to confirm or deny it but logically it just kind of sounds great but i don't want to i don't want to run into deepities <laughs> if i can avoid them what motivated you to turn towards that stuff and try to build a memory palace in the heart of that hell? Uh, ultimately, I don't necessarily know. I mean, the whole adventure from the beginning, where does it begin? Where does the chain begin? I mean, with the, with getting into Sanskrit, it comes down to a guy named Ben saying, hey, have you heard of this Gary Weber guy? Well, we were actually talking about atheism and uh, and I was just, I would I'd never, he asked me if I would ever do this kind of meditation with mantras or whatever. And I'm like, nah, I would never do that. All this, you know, woo-woo stuff that's cooked into those mantras. <laughs> and, then, and then he's like, yeah, well, Gary Weber, you know, he had some conditions and needed to be scientific and so forth. And then he he kind of lightly pressed on, you know, he memorized it and you, you can memorize it. So that's off to the races with that. And then it, like the adventure just keeps continuing. So I think it's disingenuine to say, oh, well, I found some courage or something like this, right? It's just once you're, once you're into this, you're looking at the logic of what the Sanskrit is saying about the nature of thought or whatever it might be saying, uh, the nature of irrationality, the nature of, uh, of having an unconditioned mind or et cetera. You know, that logic itself has this little force that starts to move you in certain directions. 
Uh, and all the more so when you memorize it because you're reflecting on it. And the way I memorize with very specific images of people, then it becomes almost like a meta for some of those people because you know they're helping me and then their memories you know I focus on the good things and 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 be very thankful that even if there's some bad stuff here there in the other place that you know they they were part of all this so it's almost more coming to realize that, that there is no you and what there is there is is stitched together from so many things and you're just damn lucky that it's going in the direction it's going because there's many other directions it could go. And I can't take responsibility for any of it. The good news is I couldn't take responsibility for any of the other stuff either, but I didn't know that then. And because of the training, it's like self-punishment after self-punishment after self-punishment. And I mean, the bad training, the, the, the implicit stuff that just seeps in. And, you know, a lot of people call this conditioning and this is not some new uh, highfalutin theory here, but I think the uh, the cool thing is is to get to be the one, so to speak. And I don't mean the one in a mystical sense, but to get to be the one individual who actually runs into the trees in the forest and runs into the forest in the first place, or has the bulldozer of something happen to you where it the message makes sense. The signal gets through the noise. You receive the signal. It breaks through and it causes the motion that then leads to the next motion and the next motion and the next motion. And with these kinds of practices, I can't be alone in being more and more aware of the illusion of the mind and not falling for the story that there's this guy named Anthony who's somehow, you know, escaped the matrix. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's not like that at all, even though it seems that way. It, it's 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 a lot of fantasy production of how the brain patches together an image that allows evolution to do its work, which is very clear. And uh, not everybody agrees with it, but whether you believe it or not, or you agree with it or not, that science explanation is not a story. And the evidence is quite strong for it. And it's very hard for the ego to figure out the difference. And it probably needs to be hard for the ego because, well, you know, uh, you, you wind up like Schopenhauer. Although Nietzsche said about Schopenhauer that that dude sat at his desk grumbling all day about how terrible everything is, but he still went home and played the flute at night. <laughs> so it couldn't have been all that bad for even Schopenhauer. <laughs> I could continue asking about this. This is a very fascinating topic. But that's why we talk to each other. You know, it's it's consciousness over here, like this is theory, but consciousness over here, talking to consciousness over there. And if you were to really scale back, what is it that this species is doing on the planet? And why does why why is it what, what is it doing with its computational consciousness that distinguishes us from cows, you know, or or cats or or chickens or whatever? And I mean, it if you just look at everything as it is, according to the news and Twitter and all that sort of stuff, consciousness has created this hierarchy of, of beings, meat tubes, that talk to each other in, in very scattered ways, but nonetheless in collaborative ways that have cooked up Wall Street and Tesla and SpaceX and all this stuff, all with this propulsive force that is collaborating to at least try to get this form of consciousness beyond the stars to escape the heat death of this universe, right? And, and I'm being quite influenced by Douglas Hofstadter's Gödel Escher Bach, where he talks about how bees behave and ants behave, and the, the ants don't necessarily know what they're doing. But we somehow have this self-reflective capacity, and we think we know what we're doing, and at some level, we are doing something. But what is that thing that we're doing? Like, what is this all about? That we are now progressed to the point where you can look up in the sky and see a space station. Like, what for? <laughs> you know? And it's it, it's like this quest to not have consciousness die. It's, it's anti-Buddha. 
You know, we're supposed to blow out the flame, <laughs> but, but but we've got all these resources that are that are conspiring to take the flame into infinity and beyond, which is to me more evidence of of non duality and pure imminence. We're not divided from any of it, according to that theory. So all of reality is building itself out of itself and has all kinds of mechanisms and strategies to not disappear. Will it succeed? Who knows? <laughs> and Spinoza, he's super fascinating because he has this kind of idea is that, yeah, you don't have to worry about dying. You don't have to worry about your, your meat tube because any assuming that consciousness stays in this form, the information just passes through storage and retrieval devices. And as long as there are storage and retrieval devices and information, there's going to be recursion. That information is going to repeat over and over and over and over and over again. And with set theory in math, it's not like there's infinite different ways of thinking about anything. There's probably like three to five ways of thinking about anything, and they just appear infinite, but they collect into sets. And again, I think Shakespeare was switched onto this. If there be nothing new but that which is, have been before, how are our brains beguiled? Yeah, he's really switched on to repetition and how. I mean, this is where you could think of cycles, but I don't think you need a cycle to see that repetition is compounding on itself. And and in Antony and Cleopatra, I, I don't quite have this line totally correct, but you know, they're basically making what some people think is a is a a joke about the phallus. But I think it's uh, actually a comment on reality and empire and sovereignty and all that sort of stuff. And it's like they're talking about the the crocodile or whatever. And he says, "How big is it?" And Antony says. It is as tall as it is. It is as broad as it had breadth, and it moves with its own organs. Well, that's basically what you know. We hear physicists saying all the time. Well, reality is uh, sometimes at this level it is uh, curved on the x y axis. At this level, it's totally flat, and it's just moving. It's just doing. It's just <laughs> anyway. Uh, I think if we look at what humans are trying to do, they're just trying to be part of perceiving what's happening and not stop let making sure the game doesn't stop at all costs uh so that's my that's that's my heavily influenced by other people's ideas idea of of, of how this is all going and it's just passing through me as uh, spinoza said not necessarily unique to me yeah fascinating indeed and how how could it be unique to me that that's what consciousness is is it's the non-unique processor of other non-unique things that combine them into endless brain candy, uh, some of which has tremendous consequence, uh, and other things are just maybe consequential. Fascinating indeed. Well, let's turn then to our application mm -hmm. of your memorization of Sanskrit texts and verse and so on. How have you gone about that? Can you share with us your approach as a sort of representative example of the way you work? Mm -hmm. Yes. So verbally, it works very simply. A memory palace is a mental recreation of a building, and I use memory palaces for all of it. And what that means is if we have a word, I'm going to place it somewhere in space, and then I'm going to have an association that is tethered or tied or interwoven with the, the target information. So if it's like Tartva, Moharnavam, Hatva, Ragadveshti, Rakshashan, Yoga, Shanta, Sama, Yukta, Ramo, Varajite, right? That's going to start with Tartva. And to make that a little bit more concrete, I've made some slides which I can share. But what I just recited there is in my long-term memory. I'm not thinking about the memory palace, but I use the memory palace in a particular way to get that stuff into long-term memory. And that's a very, very important principle because I will tell you this. If you don't use the memory palace for recall rehearsal, my my argument is is this is a waste of time. <laughs> I don't I don't do the Sherlock Holmes. I must go to my memory palace kind of thing, or I must go to my mind palace, as he puts it. I use it as a very specific space repetition device in order to facilitate information into long term memory as quickly as possible, and at volume, uh, ideally, because I like these long projects. Although I will do little snippets like. Uh, that Shakespeare quote or, or the, the two of them uh, that I gave. And 
even they, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it without this process that we're going to talk about. So shall I share uh, the screen here? Yeah, please. And in particular, not only how to make the memory palace, but if you could say a little bit about this idea of space repetition and yeah, I will. how you use it for that, because that's getting something in the short term memory is one thing, not so difficult, really, but to transfer it into long term memory, that's something else. Yeah, it is. And that's the only thing I'm interested in. I mean, I've gone and competed. And one thing to understand if you ever see the memory competitors is that's a very different thing than what I'm talking about, but they're cousins. They're tied at the hip nonetheless, even though they're very different. And so what they're doing is they're trained, they're heavily trained to deal with numbers, with vocabulary that's typically in their mother tongue and playing cards. And they they sometimes throw in, I was just uh, the commentator at the 2023 Pan American Open Memory Competition, which is a tremendous honor to be invited to comment on what they're doing. And they threw in this, this random surprise event where they had them memorizing clouds, cloud formations. Uh, you know, so that's like a, a special topic. And uh, they did surprisingly well. I was, I was totally blown away. They asked me too, how do you think they're doing it? And I said, oh, probably zero, zero to 99 PAO or some variation on that. And then at the end, we were asking them and I was pretty close uh, in, in my prediction of how you would do that. But I've never done it myself, uh, memorizing random cloud formations. But nonetheless, they're heavily trained to do certain tasks for short-term recall. But you know, ask them three days later without some sort of re uh, spaced re rehearsal or spaced repetition, they're not going to remember much, if any, of it. Um, although you, you, you'd be surprised sometimes uh, what they could do, but that's not the purpose of it. It's It's short-term recall. Okay, so with all these things in mind, what we're looking at is an artist's representation of where the Ribhu Gita is. Also, the Upadesa Sharam is in this uh, region here, and my TEDx talk is in here. But just to keep it simple, the idea of how I create a memory palace, I'll show you a drawing later, because it doesn't look as cool as this when I draw them, and I draw them for a specific reason. But the idea is to have a journey that is clear and crisp based on a place that I know and only on my memory of the place. So I don't want to memorize a building. I don't want to memorize the journey in the building. I want to use a combination of what I remember about a location and a logical progression. And I would advise everybody to do that. Although obviously there are no memory palace police and you want to experiment and there may be other ways that you arrive at accomplishing similar things. Um, I'm not sure why it's not advancing here. Wait a second. Oh, here we go. So to make that a little bit more clear about what I mean by basing it on memory and having a clear and distinct journey, this is a little bit more of a close up of where the memory palace starts and the straight line. So on the bed is where it starts in this particular illustration, and then it moves with its own organs, <laughs> so to speak. It moves straight, and then it goes down through the elevator, and then it's going through this neighborhood. And that, again, is basing it on memory. It's a true memory palace. I haven't memorized anything about this. This is logical. If I'm moving out of that bedroom through the apartment, that's the B line. Nothing to memorize about it. And... That's a very, very important principle, even though there are more sophisticated ways to do things. Now, you might notice that you know the kitchen isn't – there isn't a detour into the kitchen. I don't use the kitchen in this memory palace at all because that would require me to remember that I went into the kitchen. I just use the straight line. Now, let's look inside of a room. This is a particularly spare bedroom, but that's what I'm doing, and I'm layering things on the walls, just like I illustrated here with the bookshelf by pointing at it. Now, I'm not literally sitting in the room imagining myself looking at walls, but some people do that. They imagine themselves in these memory palaces, and they imagine themselves interacting with images they're going to layer onto the walls. I just basically sit there, and I think about how the wall is going to interact with text. So depending on how you count it, this is the second line of the Upadesa Sharam. Um, and... So this is a particular representation from a YouTube video. 
of the text. And I memorized it partly from this text while I was listening to people sing it, but I also memorized it from how it's represented in Gary Weber's Happiness Beyond Thought. So you can see that's quite a different representation. Here, the Sanskrit has some English and it has the, the homophonic transliteration. And then here, it's just homophonic transliteration. And one way that you can use the memory palace is to write, so to speak, or inscribe your images horizontally, just as they are represented here right now. However, that's not how I tend to do it. What I tend to do is like this. So if we quadrant it into threes, not that I literally am always thinking one, two, three, but I just generally have a kind of rule of threes going on. Kriti mahodado, patanakaranam, phalamashashvatam, gatimirodhakam. And that would be a room. And the exact images, I don't necessarily remember what the images that I use, but kriti mahodado probably was something like my, uh, uh, like a, 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 a Cree sort of chief maybe, and he maybe is uh, drinking tea. So kriti, and then Mahodado probably was Mo from The Simpsons, uh, who owns the bar, like that kind of stuff, right? And on my first pass, I'm not worried about what it means. I just want to get the sound down. And then, you know, as you learn a language, or I'm not really learning Sanskrit, but you know, you, you come to think, oh, phalum, that's fruit. So, you know, that that sort of gets in. And that, that's kind of an easier one because the f sound is the same, if my memory serves. And that's correct. <laughs> I'm not even sure. But um, uh, the, the, the general meaning, the way I memorize the meaning is I, I don't, or I, I don't very often memorize the translation verbatim. I just memorize the Sanskrit verbatim. And then I memorize the gist of the translation. And the reason why I do that is because there's so many possible ways to translate it. And you'll see different translations in English. But if you just know the Sanskrit and you start to learn what the words mean, then you could produce your own sort of explanations and, and interpretations and cross-index them against other ones, which is what you're going to do anyway, whether you memorize uh, a uh, English translation or mother tongue translation or not. Um, and just to look at a different example in a different way that I do it, some books, this is Atma Bodha, they don't come with the Sanskrit at all. So this is the 50th verse. I think I just recited this actual line um, when I was first demonstrating the, the wall, Tertva. Uh, this, I had to find Sanskrit transliterated and I just wrote it into the book so that I can then memorize it. And that, that's cool with me. I don't mind doing that with my books, but if you don't like to do that, you could uh, use a index card uh, and just write out the Sanskrit uh, or whatever it is that you want to do and not harm your book. So, and then you can have them in, in the pages. So that's basically another way of memorizing from a text. And in this case, I also haven't memorized the, this is James Schwartz uh, translation with commentary. I haven't memorized his exact English translation either. And sometimes I will say, you know, after you sail past the like-dislike monster in the sea of suffering, you will wind up in the ocean of contentment or whatever. So I may like totally iterate different ways of explaining what the Sanskrit means if I'm sharing it with anyone. And that's playing a bit fast and loose with it. And I, and I, and I understand that, but at the end of the day, uh, nobody's, uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm very comfortable with that and I'm not, uh, posing as a Sanskrit scholar or anything like that. But I do see it's sort of weakness. It's just I don't want to spend the time memorizing one English translation that's then going to sort of fix me uh, or behold me to that when I get what, what's being said there. Uh, and, and, and I think it can be iterated in multiple ways. Now, in terms of prep for these big, long memorization projects, <laughs> this is not like the graphic that we saw before that the artist put together. This is how I draw it out. So I, I want to do this so that I don't have to think about it later. And I'm just strategizing the logical path. This is a, a, a neighborhood going into the buildings. And one of the cool features of numbering your stations is 
This is a bit more intermediate advanced, but you can have an image for every number from 00, zero to 99 or beyond. Some people have 000, zero, zero, nine, nine, nine. I just do 00, zero to 99. And then if I need three digits or four digits, I either double the system or I add a secondary system. Uh, but I can I know that the 50th verse is the one that starts Tarva because I've added an image that helps me remember that that's the 50th one. And the 49th one has an image and the first one has an image, et cetera. And th that's helpful for people who want to memorize scripture, like Proverbs 18, 13, to answer before listening. That is folly and shame. If you really want to remember that that specifically is 18, 13, then you use these number systems to help you codify in your memory that that's what, what that is. So that's why I do that. And then the 50th station here, it's this house. I went on Google Earth <laughs> to look it up. And uh, that's exactly what I'm doing, the outside of the building. This is another example of where I have a really nasty memory where I held a lot of resentment. I didn't even know how much resentment I really had. I knew I had the resentment, but I didn't know how much resentment that I had for this particular individual. Uh, he was a pastor who was very, very passionate about describing just how long hell takes place if you wind up there and exactly what happens there. So I wound up with that particular verse at his house and basically how this, this doesn't look exactly like this, but if we think of those three quadrants, it's kind of like this, uh, these platforms, almost like uh, Donkey Kong, the video game where you have platforms and I'm just segmenting the space, something like that. And then I start to lay in the images. So Tertva, how are we going to memorize this sound? Well, T, Thor. Thor and Tertva start with T. And then that Ert sound is kind of like Kurt Cobain. Va is not exactly like, and actually it may be that the, the proper pronunciation is Tertva. Uh, with the Sanskrit. So I, I, maybe uh, I, I have to check with a, a proper Sanskrit scholar, but just going with a, with fast and hard memorization, Steve Vai is not exactly Va, but that's how, I, that's the image that I use. And I'm just sort of writing it, so to speak, in space, in a pillar from top to bottom. But sometimes I will switch and an alternative is to do it this way. And you can get more in if you do it this way. And I don't, I, I'm not beholden to one way or another because I just want speed. So I go with, uh, it, it's kind of like a Bruce Lee, be water, my friend. I just go with whatever it feels is right. The way a painter would sometimes do this stroke and sometimes do that stroke, et cetera. And that's the, that's sort of the long and short of it. And normally I like to use the beautiful buildings of Australia where I have no history and not necessarily trying to, to cleanse any memory. And buildings about this tall, you can get more than three. So right here is the, is the capping verses of the Ripu Gita. And I can get quite a lot in a taller building like that. So uh, Atma Janam Param Shastram, Atma Janam Manupamem, Atma Janam Paro Yoga, Atma Janam Paragati. That's all just basically not exactly right there but basically right there and those are longer lines and and they fit quite nicely in a top to bottom uh formation so that's the slide presentation uh but th that's generally how it works and happy to clarify anything but maybe before we do that shall we cover the recall rehearsal part and see how that works oh yes okay so try to think about what's the best way to explain this. Um, if we can imagine the neighborhood like this, which is a little bit more neat and tidy than my journey, that bed is one. Then the area outside the bed where that bicycle is, is two. Then the keyboard is three. The door where that guitar is, is four and then five. And if we just think about a rule of 10, let's say, we get 10 stations together. The way that recall rehearsal works is to revisit information in patterns. And I tend to, wherever possible, work in, in, in a flow of 10. So 
we want to revisit information in different orders. And the reason why we want to do that is because there's there's laws that govern the reality of memory. And those laws are primacy effect, recency effect, and the forgetting curve. And so what happens if you memorize information and you always start at the beginning is you front load the beginning of the thing you've memorized with primacy effect, and you're going to remember it a lot better. And you then may remember the end of the line due to recency effect better, and the middle will fall out with the fall with the uh, forgetting curve. So how do we defeat this? Well, I don't just recall things forward. I recall them backward also, which is a stretch, you know, to, to, to think of a line backwards, but I do it and it gets it into long-term memory faster. I also start in the middle of a line and I move to the beginning and I start in the middle and then I move to the end. So now we get primacy and recency in the middle and to really go for gold. This is an idea I got out of Aristotle. Because uh, Aristotle says in De Memoria, his 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 book on memory, he says, and, and this puzzles so many scholars. There's a guy named Richard Sarabji. He's just like, what the heck is Aristotle talking about? To start in the middle of the alphabet, and I believe what he's talking about is that his memory palaces were all lettered, not numbered the way I've shown, but lettered. But back then, I believe they all had every letter of the alphabet was known to also be a number, and so. It's pretty clear to me what he's saying is, is don't just go into your memory palaces from beginning to end, go into them in the middle sometimes and travel into the different directions. And then uh, what I do to really make this fast is I skip the stations. So instead of like Tertva, Mohanrava, Mahatva, Ragadvesh, Jirakshashan, yada, 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 it's like Tertva, Hartva, and then, you know, Yoga, Shanta, Samayukta, I'm skipping them. And then I'll go back the other way. And so it's like Varajate, skip Ramo, go to Shanta Sema Yukta Atma. Sorry, it's Shanta, Shanta Sema Yukta Atma. And I just skip them. So it's like one, three, five. Do that with Latin, et cetera. The only exception to the rule is if, if I've memorized it verbatim, in, like in my TEDx talk, I didn't do the, the sentences backwards. But what I did do is I did the speech from beginning to end. And then I did the sentence backwards, like last sentence skip the penultimate sentence, then the sentence before that. And that really just made me memorize it so much faster and with so much more certainty that it was in memory. And uh, yeah, that's that's how that's spaced out. Now, you also space it out over time. So you want to revisit these things according to, you know, when you're learning this in the beginning, you want to do it more often than not. But Typically, when I'm memorizing something, I try to revisit it about five times the first day, and then maybe once a day after that for about five days, and maybe once a week for the next five weeks. And with that in, in play, I'm typically pretty good. Certain words will fall out if I'm tired, uh, if something's distracting or what have you. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why you might drop a word. Uh, it's like such as they're, they're they're in a foreign language and 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 you don't necessarily know every jot and tittle of of, of the language, but uh, I think those are pretty minor things, uh, and and it just build progressively, uh, add add more. It's it's like beading a, a thread. Wow, amazing! And so after you've done this process of five times a day, and then. Once a day for five days, and then once a week for five weeks. How long could you go? Do you think without revisiting something like the Rubu Gita before before it would start to atrophy in a serious way? That's partly known and partly unknown. So, and the reason why I say that is when we when we last talked, I was uh, I was telling you, or when we last recorded, I was telling you that that I had done this experiment that was partly inspired by our first talk where I'd said, oh, I would never want to stop doing this. And then I caught it in my head. Well, what would happen if I did stop doing some of this Sanskrit? I could never totally get myself to stop all of it. But the decay rate seemed to be five or six months with the Song Celestial. The Song Celestial was, was my least favorite of it. But I can still get through about half of what I memorized. And then... The, the latter part starts to break apart and it gets quite diffuse and, and distinct. And why the latter part? Because that was the most, that was the last part that I was working on, I, I think. 
and it probably got the least amount of attention. And then you have the primacy effect because even though I've done all those patterns, when I recite the Sanskrit, I do start at the beginning now that I've got it in long-term memory. So I don't know exact number, but I'd say four or five, six months. Then when I went back to it, it was just, I, I noticed that because that was the one that I allowed to drop. Wow. Around halfway mark, it's just falling apart. Uh, and, and it's kind of neat though, because I, I know where it, I know where that it originally ended. And even if I, it would, it would be uh, painful to watch me try to like resurrect some of those words there, but um, uh, you know, I can go back and I remember deep pain as being a word for lamp uh, as being near the end. Uh, you know, just, there's this cool thing. There's, there's still a, a fossil there of a, of a lot of it. Uh, but yeah, I think the timing is different. The one person to look at it for people who are interested is a guy named Herman Ebbinghaus. I think it's maybe 1895 or 1885, probably better, that he released a book called Uber das Gedächtnis in German, which me is usually translated as memory, but it really literally means um, uh, about memory. And what, what Ebbinghaus did is he memorized, I think in German, they're called sinlose Silben, which means senseless syllables. Or, and he just made up a bunch of words and, and tried to memorize them. And he te- this is where the term forgetting curve comes from. He literally tested how, what the rate of decay was for those words. And, you know, that would be his, his anecdotal evidence, so to speak. But people have been referring to his work ever since, and you know they've done a lot of. Uh, there's no reproducibility problem that I can see in in this particular realm of of science uh, and memory science. So, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question, but I don't have a, a super clear, distinct answer. I think it, I think it differs depending on the nature of the information, how that it's worked with, and you know, there's sometimes these astonishing examples where Anthony Hopkins or whatever will be on an interview and he'll just tear out a bunch of Shakespeare. And it's just, you know, I haven't done that for 18 years, but it still, you know, kind of comes out and his rate of recall is going to be different than somebody else's just due to a career of, of memory work. And do you think in his case or cases like his, are they, are are actors like that using memory palaces or is it raw repetition and, encoding it in the body through movement and breath, et cetera. Some are, some aren't. My hypothesis would be that even those who aren't are still using ample doses of spatial memory and elaboration. And one evidence for that, or maybe better said, one thought puzzle for people to work out for themselves is if you're memorizing anything, how is it not somewhere in, in, in space? And if you're using emotions, then you're elaborating it. Where is that elaboration taking place? So they may be imagining where the scene takes place. They may be, you know, uh, and, and Mark Shannon, he's a, I think he was the eighth world memory champion. He's also an actor and he's written some books about this. And essentially, I mean, I don't want to, I know that I'm biased and so forth and I don't want to like, make everything spatial. But as I read his work on memory techniques for actors, it it all comes down to having some kind of spatial foundation and elaboration taking place in space. And besides which, you read it from a page. Gary Weber had told me after I shared with him how I memorized the work that he put together, uh, you know, sometimes extracting lines from Ripu Gita and so forth. He said, oh, that's so interesting. I have a feeling that I just can see the page in my mind, which would be having a spatial reference at some level. But I I don't want to push that on him, but that's what it sounds like to me. Um, And I can certainly memorize from pages too. I sometimes use individual pages as memory palaces, which is a a kind of a neat trick uh, if you have a number system, because you can use the number as an initial image that will help you interact with the information that's on the page. And then you can just you know, I could pull off a book off the shelf and be like, okay, page 71, this dude, uh, uh, he's talking about Eckhart, Meister Eckhart's 19 sermon. He's quoting Acts 9, 8, Saul rose up from the ground and saw nothing. And I know very specifically <laughs> what page of the book that's on, uh, just because I, I don't care what page it's on, but that's how I helped myself remember that 
in the 19th sermon, Meister Eckhart is talking about the, that, that it's Acts 9, 8, Act 9, 8. And then maybe one day I'll actually go and read the 19th sermon of Meister Eckhart. I don't know, but it's kind of like a, I call it a magnetic bookmark. It's not only a bookmark of where the information is, but a bookmark of like, I'll go look that up. I'm thinking of some ways that one might do this wrong. So let me, let me do that. And then perhaps you can tell me why it's wrong, or maybe it's not. Um, but I think it might. I don't be. believe there is a wrong, actually. Well, according to at least the model you've you've suggested. Um, okay, I'm going. I want to memorize the uh, this this Sanskrit line, for example. Okay, T. Okay, that's like Thor. Er, that's like Nirvana. Va. Okay, that's like Vi. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, ter, and then I'm going to think of Thor, and then next one, think of Nirvana, Kurt, Kurt, Kurt Cobain's image. Okay, next one, I'm going to think of Steve Vai. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, and and just going to do it like that, kind of flashing the images in my mind as I repeat the the words and phrases. But that lack seems to lack a certain spatial element, and it it certainly is not a memory palace. It's a sort of an attempt to associate mm -hmm. images in some way. What's wrong with that? Or how can well, a better way of saying it? What how can that be improved or brought more closely in line with the model you've been suggesting? I guess I mean if we're gonna just be liberal with language. It's wrong in the sense that if it doesn't work, then you know that's obviously not, not an effective strategy. But there may be some cases where some people can get away with that. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't have all the time in the world to test all these people who have told me all sorts of claims. But some people say they don't need a memory palace. They just elaborate without a spatial reference. I find it it's quite difficult. And usually when I do talk to some of them, it turns out, oh, yes, uh, th th there is this. I've had this uh, with one of the people who's been on my podcast, uh, Mike McKinley, I think his name was, and he had memorized some 66 Psalms or something. And as we were poking around, you know, he had said, well, I didn't use uh, memory palaces, but once I asked him questions, there is a spatial reference. So what I would suggest is, is go ahead and try anything that comes to your mind and just have radical honesty. You either recall it or you don't. And then if you're not getting the result that you want, especially when you want to scale to dozens of shlokas or whatnot, it's very unlikely as far as I can tell that you would be able to do that without not only space, but space so that you can do the kind of spaced repetition that I've talked about. I don't know how you would organize it if you're just kind of like flashing images to do the rotation. Uh, and, you know, again, just to think of Bruno and earlier people like Ramon Lull, part of the way that they enabled themselves to do the rotation was the memory wheel, which is, a, is not quite a memory palace, but it still would be revisiting things out of order, which is going to generate a, a larger amount of recall because of the ability to refer to things in space and and have it in different orders, which is serial positioning effect. So I don't think it's a right or wrong, but it's just kind of radical honesty. Is it working or not? And there's a lot of people who delude themselves, <laughs> at least in my experience of meeting them, because as soon as I ask them, you know, hey, can you do anything? And then crickets. Oh, that's interesting. Well, before I t before I probe you a bit on that, so you're saying that the actual spatial aspect, the memory palace aspect, has many uses. One of which is scale, and also review. And these are review strategies of of going out of order. You can walk through your route, for example, and that that supports the review process and also supports the scaling of it. Yeah, that's very interesting indeed. Yeah. Okay. Um. So when you say there's a lot of people del del deluding themselves, well. Like you said, you either remember it or, or you don't. Can you say a little bit more about these this sort of delusional behavior you see? Oh, it just runs the gamut. I mean, today somebody on YouTube was saying that some hermetic oath was itself a mnemonic. And if you would just uh, focus on only this oath and accept its stuff, then you would have absolute recall. And he was actually a little bit intellectually charitable because I called him on it. I was like, oh, really? You know, you can you 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 can do this with this oath. Would you like to come on the podcast? Because I would I would love to throw some stuff at you and and uh, and hear how the oath helps you. And he even used the word consolidation. And uh, 
he he came back and he said he admitted that he was being a bit fast and loose with his words and he probably shouldn't you know have uh have said those things and that's very rare actually because normally people come and double back and they're just like oh you're 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 a jerk and like all this sort of stuff uh there there's been other memory courses one in particular i won't name it but it's disappeared from the internet and it was almost cult-like in its nature where people were for whatever reason beholden to creating challenges to me and you know this particular school will demolish you if you were ever to meet any of us in public i'm like well, fine come on let's let's do something you know or whatever and then crickets like they just don't show up um and you know i i i think people fall in love with memory and and they may have experiences in the same way that there, there's people who have spiritual experiences that then cleaves them dogmatically to this or that thing and i mean i kind of get it that that that's a memory plays a big role in that uh primacy effect can hold you to certain things and you just delude yourself um you know uh, no net like delusion as the uh, as the uh <laughs> buddha says in dhammapada uh and i mean i i don't mean to judge anybody i'm sure i've had had similar delusions although i work very hard to not have them uh, and try to catch myself and to avoid dogmatism and you know when people ask me can i do it this way is there a right or wrong i usually say i don't think there's a wrong and i don't think there are memory palace police who are going to come and you know drag you away in the middle of the night to a recorrection <laughs> correction center because you you use the memory palace differently I, I go back to what i said before with uh david Berglis. everybody interprets the traditional wisdom in their own way the question is do they, you know, or is set theory going to pressure them to arrive at one of a limited set of possible ways to do this? And if they're really doing it and they're radically honest to it, then they're, they're probably going to be more modest. They're probably going to be more like my friends in the memory competition world who are very clear about their limits. They're also very clear about their goals. They often keep journals. Johannes Malo was very generous. He's one of the most impressive memory competitors in the world. He was so generous to come on the podcast and talk at length about how he keeps a journal to not only track where he's at, but find spots to improve. And they're 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 just they're they're amazing in terms of uh, of just not being like some other people who just get strange. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I guess whatever helps you uh, is cool, but I, I'm often astonished by how some people behave around this, hmm. as I'm sure they're astonished by me. I, 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 it goes both ways, but nonetheless, it, 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 it's quite weird, but I'm sure it shows up in every uh, discipline. May I play devil's advocate then with one aspect? Hmm. You're, you want to memorize this uh, sacred scripture, Sanskrit, whatever the case may be in your, in your case. And you're associating images of Thor and Nirvana, Kurt Cobain, Steve Vai, and that sort of thing. Does, does that obscure the meaning, uh, your ability to access the meaning and profundity of the text? If whenever you think of that word, uh, you, you've associated it now with, with Steve Vai. Is that not to say, of course, that Steve Vai is not profound, uh, for the love of God, is a very profound uh, guitar piece, of course. But It is. <laughs> uh, but, you know... Uh, is there something is there something here that one you're cluttering up this text with all these associations and images and locations and so on surely surely this is uh this is going to obscure or muddy your connection to to the meaning uh, uh, for example what would you say to that doesn't all this stuff get in the way is what i'm is, is, the, is the category of criticism i'm throwing at you well, uh, the Nirvana Shatakam would say that you are not your mind, you're not your memory, you're not anything in your memory uh, by extension. So I don't, I, I don't. If you're going to be an extreme non-dualist, as I, noting metaphorical truth as having a fundamental role here, but if I'm going to actually practice the practice, that's not possible because I'm not separate from it. It's not separate from me. It's 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 there. Why not use it? Right. But I've encountered certain people and I, I do try to practice a sensitivity around it. So if it's like someone's asking me for, uh, I don't even know if I know it properly because uh, I've never really memorized it. But if someone's asking me for like, how do I memorize Bismillah, uh, you know, which is the beginning of the Quran, you know, I, 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 that th often they will say you're, you're not allowed to associate anything to God uh, or Allah. 
And then I, I just say, well, okay, then maybe this isn't the practice for you, but I have to tell you that Allah is an association <laughs> to God. Like, uh, like how, 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 how does that square? Right. Wouldn't, wouldn't the fact that you have a name for, for the figure, you know, like, I, I, I think, I think there's a, a logical problem in having things separate you from the source, especially when we're in spiritual territory, right? Why would it exist if it was separate from the maker? The meaning of maker is connection. That's why we call it the maker, <laughs> right? So, but I know that some people have, well, you know, primacy effect to how that they were taught it and they can't shake it very easily. So I try to be maximally sensitive around it, but not so much so that I dodge what I think is is a, is a basic fundamental logical fact of how association works. You're asking me about it with words and you're using the word Allah, so. Right, I think my question is more aimed, I suppose, at a bit more procedural or practical um, mm. uh, level. Oh. Let's say I want to memorize this, as, so scriptural pa pa practices, uh, um, uh, scriptural uh, passages, so that I can recall them and muse on them and they can feed me with their nourishment, uh, feed my soul, or whatever the case is, right? Or I want to, you know, rattle them off and impress friends at dinner parties and that, you know, on dates or whatever the case is. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, th that's the thing, you know, will, will uh, I, you know, when I'm thinking of, when I'm meditating on my shloka, I don't necessarily, um, or reciting my shloka, I don't necessarily want to be seeing Kurt Cobain's face and so on and so forth. So oh, is yeah. there a sense in which, in, in which those associations might get in the way of um, connection to the material in, in that rather more procedural or practical sense. Sorry, I, mi I misunderstood the, 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 the nature of your question. For me, no, because I don't think about these images. They, I use those patterns to get them into long-term memory. Now, sometimes they will come up. Typically, when they come up has to do with the fact that it's a friend that I used. And that sort of is that sort of meta experience that I told you about before. So, um, if I if I'm thinking there's a particular passage or a particular part of Rupu Gita and it has Nishitam in it, for a convoluted reason, I worked on a niche with a guy, a business partner, you know, and we dissolved a business that we built together at one point. At a certain point, I wasn't so happy about that, but nonetheless, I always have this. He comes to mind often when I come across that line, and it doesn't obscure my meditation of the line at all. If anything, it's just par for the course of the practice, right? And and you know any any uh, resentment or whatever that I had is long gone around that. And he comes up sometimes, other times not. But personally, for me, there is no. It doesn't even follow from the logic of the teaching that those things would would uh, cause a problem. Because the Ripu Gita itself, uh, in in basically the second part of the extract from Weber's Evolving Beyond Thought, it says that a real thought is as rare as a rabbit's horn. So, you know, just if 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 push comes to shove and it rattles your cage, just remember that because that's that's actually uh, I think true. A rare uh, a real thought is as rare as a rabbit's horn. We mentioned that we would also discuss some other possible examples, and I, as you mentioned earlier. I'd suggested Antony's funeral oration from Julius Caesar, which I I find tremendously always a powerful passage, and it's a classic, right? A classic mm -hmm. one from his countrymen. So I'm not asking you to memorize it on the spot. It's not a memory competition. I'm wondering if you might give a sense, perhaps for the first few lines or so, how, what sort of imageries you might walk us through uh, in, a, in, a, in a sort of overview, summary kind of a sense. I'm not asking you to, to, to do it in detail here. Could you give us a sense of how, what sort of images you might go with, what, how, how this might work if you were to take a first glance at that? Okay, so here it is. I've brought it up here. Friends, Romans, yeah. countrymen, lend me your ears. Um, so I, I suggested this to you the other day, and um, and I was very pleased to hear that you enjoyed it. So I don't know if you want to say something about about this passage and your your initial response to it, and then perhaps how you how you go about memorizing it. Well, I think it's amazing. It's tough in terms of the meaning of it in the play very very challenging play for me i don't know why but it just seems so dark <laughs> but in terms of just the memorization of it the first thing that i would say is 
I wouldn't memorize it from a screen. I find that quite challenging, but I would have the book and I would also draw the memory palace first so that I have a sense of where I'm going before that I get there. So I don't have to build the memory palace as I go. Now I can sort of start to build it just here, just by thinking friends. So who, who, the most logical thing for me there is Rachel and Joey, I guess they're called like all those characters that we had shoved down our throats for 10 years. <laughs> I love them. They're not separate, but you know, just, just try to go with the most obvious thing in the world. Now, if you don't know what friends is the TV show and the theme song doesn't instantly come to your mind, you could think of a friend, right? And you may have a, and, and what can help this is to have a friend whose name starts with F. So I have a friend named Frank. And I might go with that. Now, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. So we have Frank here. He's going to be talking about friends. Maybe he's got a friends t-shirt on or what have you. And then, you know, the, the next line, countrymen or noblemen or whatever, Romans, sorry. So we want to now have Roman. So what are we going to do for that? I used to have a boss named Roman, actually. So I might start to weave that in, right? And He's maybe reading the Book of Roman, uh, which, I, or sorry, I think it's called the Book of Romans uh, in the, in the Bible. Uh, so that's even better. Uh, whatever we start to work with it. So friends, Romans, countrymen, and then you know sometimes you don't even need an image because th this line is. I, I'm surprised that I dropped Romans because it's not that unknown of a line. But anyway, friends, Romans, countrymen. Now that might be more than enough right there. I might need to move on, right? But because We've got some people in my version of this, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ear. If I take, I don't know, Cookie Monster or something like that for countrymen, because cookie and country start with C, I can have him like pushing forward his ear or he's maybe trying to borrow an ear on the next part of the Mary Palace from a giant eye, right? So now this giant eye is going to... Well, you know, sometimes these images that we use are are uh, very on the nose, very blunt. So I come may suggest something to you without me having to point it out. But uh, now we have a burial, bury Caesar. So I come to bury Caesar. So the eye is doing something suggestive to the burial of Caesar. If we want to make sure that it's really bury that we figure out, we can have a giant bury. Um, maybe more specifically, bury Manilow, right? Uh, it's kind of difficult for me to actually do it while I'm talking about it, but you know, already these images are so suggestive that that I could probably you know remember this uh, to a certain extent. Now, now you have this particular line, which is saying what it's a negation essentially, not to praise him, right? So here, you know, we might want to have Caesar tying knots something like that. And then you got to just work out what, what's it going to be to praise him. So Prince with his base, you know, something like that and, and work it out. And normally what I'm doing when I do it is I'm just doing exactly something like this, but I'm doing it without telling it to myself. I'm more using a, 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 an alphabetical association to go with the most suggestive imagery and then I'll test myself. Now, normally I don't test myself like this. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ear. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. You know, I don't do it that way. Normally to test myself, what I'll do is I'll try to get through more lines like this. Did I actually do it? I don't know. But um, that was right. Um, if, uh, if I'm going to do it privately amongst myself, I'm going to have a journal. And I'm going to write it out by hand. Now, writing is something we didn't talk about before, but I write out a lot, not all of it, but a lot of this stuff by hand. Lynn Kelly, who's another memory expert, she says that writing is the ultimate encryption device. And so usually when I test myself, you know, I'll, I'll memorize some other Shakespeare. Oh, for a muse of fire that could ascend the brightest heaven of invention. Uh, you know, kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold our swelling scene. To to start making that, I I also did those patterns that we talked about, and then I also write it down. So I just did this, but typically what I'll do is put the book away and go and write it out from memory, 
And it may be like three hours before I actually write it down. And then I'll go back and check it against the record. And, you know, there'll be mistakes sometimes, uh, more than I would like, but a first pass is a first pass. And you sometimes got to correct things. Other times I get it. Uh, it. It depends on the complexity of the line. As I say, this negation not to praise him, that, that's a kind of thing that can be tricky. The evil that men do is going to be pretty easy one because it's a famous or at least famous to me, Iron Maiden song, right? So I'm probably just going to have, I think that that's on Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. I don't know, but uh, I'm going to have it. It is, yeah. Yeah. So I'll have that album in the Memory Palace. I'll probably hear Bruce Dickinson and he'll he'll do whatever he needs to do to get that next line. And basically what I would suggest is people just, instead of, do what I do. Instead of like racking your brain for images, train your procedural memory to come up with images. And the way that I do that, it's a couple of times a year. I just get out a piece of paper. I write out the alphabet and I just do Adam West for A, Batman or Christian Bale or Bob, <laughs> whoever that I may have met, you know, and I just write it out by hand. C, whoever I might have met you know, D, Dracula, E, Einstein. Sometimes I would just do the same things that I've done the last time. But just to have that that dexterity with the hands is very important. It's called haptic memory. Haptic memory helps grow your mouth, your brain, all, all these other things. And it just makes it fast to come up with images like this. And and, and then and then the images I won't remember later, uh, usually. I mean, I I, I can remember some of them and i can reconstruct them but i think i made a note in victorious mind when i gave all these images that half of them i had to reinvent because i don't quite remember what all, all, all what all i used through the memory palace um they're not that interesting or important they just do the job for the recall rehearsal long enough to get those patterns and then the target information remains so interesting because as you said, the Sherlock Holmes version that we see in the shows and so on, he goes into his memory palace and uses that as his means of recalling anything that, he, that at all. But you're, you're saying, no, no, this is a technique, at least primarily in the way you're using it, to, to move some information into that long-term long memory. And when, when it's in there, and one does not always have to use the, the memory palace as a, as a means of recalling. Yeah. Uh, I mean... Sometimes I, I will do that, you know, but I, I, there's a lot of times I can't because the I image is, is gone, you know, um, and also, you know, forgetting curve is pretty, pretty, pretty tough. Uh, you've taken it away from the screen and it's like friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ear. And then it's like, I come to bury Caesar. And then it's just like, not to praise him, I guess. And then uh, the evil that uh, the, the evil that men do or, you know, now, now the Iron Maiden song is like. Is it the, the, the things that men evil men do or is it the evil that men do or whatever it is, right? Like it can decay quite quickly, uh, your first pass. Uh, and you, so you, you want to reassert it. And then again, it's like, if I want to keep that, it's going to be probably wise to just repeat it about five times, not write it out five times, but, you know, just go through it. It doesn't have to be five. There's no magic number, right? Uh, and some memory books, they'll tell you, here's the magic number, repeat it that many times. I, I don't think that's the case. Um, but yeah, you really want to use these patterns to get it into long-term memory because there's no fun, there's no special fun in, 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 in the memory palace. It, I find it fun, but I treat it like a toolbox, you know, in this, I think of it this way. I, I've learned a little about you and your musicianship and, and, and maybe you can disagree and say, no, it's not like that way at all, but really a a working musician should be able to go cold into a room and play an instrument reasonably well, even if they've never touched that guitar or drum kit or what have you. Now, obviously, they're maybe going to be more well-suited if, if they've had some time with the instrument. But nonetheless, you should be able to find F-sharp on the a string you know <laughs> if you're a musician and it's the same thing with with being a person who uses memory techniques should be the case that if 
if somebody just says, hey, you need to use this room as a memory palace right now to memorize all the names in the building, that you're not humming and hawing over, well, actually, I need to get another memory palace. You just use that room as a memory palace. That's how I do many name demonstrations. Just use the room. Now, I follow certain principles like we talked about. I pick a starting point, try as much as I can. You can't always do it because sometimes people are moving around or what have you, but straight line. And then even as I'm doing it, I will do some of those recall rehearsal patterns so that when I do the demonstration, I don't fall flat on my face. Uh, and it's just it's just like an instrument. The, the space becomes like an instrument and you play it in the same way I imagine, you know, if I was a working musician and I don't get to have my special bass that, you know, I'm going to be able to play on the bass that's in the studio that day and, and do, do a great job that makes them happy enough to hire me again. Yes. I think you're right about that actually. And in fact, um, it's, if you like, uh, a, a popular thing to say about great musicians that they, you know, gee, uh, so-and-so picked up my guitar and somehow he sa- he managed to sound just like him and, or, yeah, I, I, I got a chance to play so-and-so's guitar and uh, I couldn't make the thing, I couldn't get anything out of that. And I thought, how does this guy manage to squeeze that tone? You know, you hear that all the time. Musicians have their, their special gear, but the, the grades, especially, I'm thinking of guitar, my, the area that I know the most about, very often they can, mm-hmm. they can pick up more or less any combination and they somehow manage to arrive at their own sound. And people say, it's in the hands. That's what people say, it's in the hands. You know, it's very interesting. There are, there are sort of many micro adjustments that one makes to... Um, to coax out of an unfamiliar instrument, what what needs to be what needs to be coaxed out? Um, yeah, very fascinating indeed. Now I know you teach people this, and you have a uh, courses and cohorts, and you teach them memory techniques of various different types. So I'd like you, perhaps, as we come towards the end, to say something about that. But also, uh, I wonder if you might say what are some of the benefits or or positive uh, benefits of 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 learning this sort of uh, how to memorize you know, in, in this sort of a way that you've experienced or that your students have experienced. I can I can mm. see why a, a person would like to, for instance, as someone who has a deep reverence for a scripture of some type, the Bible or whatever the case may be, um, would find great solace, spiritual solace and enrichment in, in internalizing that sort of uh, material. Um, what other sorts of po- po- positive... Um, effects have people reported to you or or if you notice yourself well that's that's a i'll try and keep this that answer short but i mean the benefits are confidence joy there's been studies that show that it helps alleviate symptoms of depression ptsd you know that that's a whole conversation probably better had with some of those scientists uh, in terms of why that that's happening in the brain. But I think it boils down to a production of dopamine and uh, more myelin and all that kind of thing. Uh, And then specifically with the Sanskrit, I mean, I meditated for a long time and I don't know quite why I was so disciplined with it other than that I had like these sapling effects of some sort of light or what have you in the center of the forehead. And somewhere I picked up this idea of the Buddha smile. And so that helped reinforce that I kept going, but really comparatively my meditation for 15, 20 years or whatever it was before I started the Sanskrit, like it's night and day. Why exactly the Sanskrit has those facts or those effects and properties. Partly, I think it's knowledge that I never thought of before meeting a deeper kind of meditation that I wasn't having by just sitting just to sit. Cause that was kind of the dogma that I followed. Haven't heard it from Alan Watts, you know, don't have a goal, all that sort of stuff. But Weber was quite different. It's like, you know, you have a goal, right. And you know, why not take the ultimate goal, which is to annihilate all thinking. And, you know, it's, it's kind of dramatic and so forth. I don't necessarily, I mean, I've, I've experienced it in, in these, these doses that are very strong and compelling, but I can't quite imagine, you know, checking out and just sitting there not talking anymore or whatever. So uh, I don't know if that's the goal for me, but nonetheless, having a goal is itself a benefit. Being able to do a kind of Kaizen and realizing day after day, another line. There are days in all of, I think it's 1700 words plus now in all of this Sanskrit that I've memorized 
where I only did one syllable sometimes, you know, but still it's, it's like this progress principle and away you go and you look back and it's just like, holy cow, I can recite Sanskrit for half an hour, 40 minutes or whatever. Um, that's, that's, that's just great in, in so many ways. And it's almost beyond, it's ineffable. There's, there's almost no way to describe the benefit. And then in just professionally, it's pretty good that I can do what I talk about <laughs> and, and do it to a particular standard that that's obvious when you see it, when I'm, when I do these live cohort courses, I mean, I don't, I don't have to go out of my way to demonstrate it. It just comes because of how much I've memorized and the facts that come out and the specificity and the angles and the details. And that's not just memorization. That's also the fact that I did a PhD and I read hundreds of books and yada, yada, yada. But even my ability to bring that stuff back and a lot of my PhD, I did use these memory techniques. So that's a benefit. And I don't mean that, that that's a benefit strictly for me. It's a benefit for anybody who would do it in their profession to be that bastion of detail. You know, the only thing is, is you got to keep your ego in check, which is, as we all know, a big old dragon and the like dislike monster as in the 50th verse of uh, Atma Boda, you know, that, that can, that can destroy you on a moment by moment basis because just because you memorize a bunch of stuff doesn't mean you know it all. Uh, it doesn't mean you mean it, you know anything. So that's another benefit. If you can keep your ego, if you can do the ego management work, then that's tremendously rewarding as well. Because as we were talking about, there's some people who make some crazy claims and they're they're clearly driven by their ego when they're like, you come compete with me and we'll destroy you. <laughs> like it's just, <laughs> okay. Why did you think of that? You were talking about these benefits and then you turned somewhat and mentioned you've got to keep your ego in check. What were you thinking of at that time? At that moment? Oh, because I have to deal with my ego all the time. Uh, I, I, I'm astonished that it hasn't gone away yet. I haven't found the root and I haven't struck that final blow. Like, again, I don't know that I would ever want to not think. And, and even Gary Weber says he still has thoughts about, you know, how he's going to get to a location or what have you. But I do wonder what it would be like to, if that's even possible to, to be totally free of the ego. But I have, you know, it, it, I feel like our last conversation when we were talking about the detective novel and all that sort of stuff, it kind of got like worldly because there's this, at least for me, uh, there's this there's this thing called the world and the internet. And in order for me to to achieve these goals of, of okay, it's like now I've got a children's book that I just wrote, and it's like, how are we going to do this? Then I have to go to Facebook, I have to figure out ads, I have to deal with profit loss reports. And then that gets into scarcity. Where is that coming from, right? And, and then, oh, like this, that, and the other thing. That, that, those are, I, I, I see all those things as manifestations of ego because if you were really free from it, if pure imminence was really true and there was no separation and you don't have any you know, necessary free will and you don't need free will because free will is itself an egotistical manifestation, well, then you should be able to just play the game and, you know, roll the dice. And if you wind up poor under a bridge, cause you made mistakes on Facebook ads or whatever, Hey, oh. cool. That's the way that went. And I really do see that as, you know, a thing where you have to manage the ego because anytime that there's material that's managed, there's going to be thoughts. There's going to be scarcity. There's going to be wish a wish. And another, like, there's background in our last conversation because in order for me to sit and write a novel this big to go through 21 iterations of it so it looks as cool as it is, it's really hard to get yourself to go through that junk. And it is a lot of junk, like to look through and make it as good as it is without having a wish that it will succeed. And it's and I have a mantra that I repeat all the time. I have a number of mantras in English, which is it's never enough. No matter how successful a thing is, it's never going to feel good enough. So that's like my preemptive strike against my own ego. And then I have to look at a lot of numbers in the work that I do. YouTube 
you you probably know yourself forces you to see one out of 10 this video made one out of 10 compared to the last one you know like i have another mantra for that numbers on a screen <laughs> which is my version of diogenes i don't know if you know that story with uh, diogenes and alexander the great but numbers on a screen is my fast way of saying that story where alexander the great he's in athens he sees diogenes diogenes is sitting in the sun He's not in his barrel for once. He's just hanging out in the sun. Alexander the Great comes up to Diogenes and he says, hey, Diogenes, you're my favorite philosopher in the world. Name one thing. I'll grant you any wish. And I can because I'm Alexander the Great. Diogenes looks up at him and he says, get out of my son. And Alexander the Great says, if I weren't already Alexander the Great, I would want to be you, Diogenes. And so, you know, Anyway, I just have all these little tricks of the trade, but my ego is with me every single day. It's like there's a Buddhist ritual that I, or a Buddhist meditation I learned one time where you walk across a bridge. And, and this was actually taught as using a temple to help you remember it. You walk across a bridge and you look down and you see your enemies shooting arrows at you, and the arrows are on fire. And that's to remind you that, you know, everything's a bridge and you got to keep moving. And, uh, you know, it can be that the bridge catches on fire, you know, so just keep moving. And then you also imagine that on the other side, they're your friends with, and they have presents for you or something like this. And that helps you remember, you know, that, that there are always more resources than you would ever need. And then you also go to another part and you remember that there's a little black dog always nipping at your heels. And that dog is the reminder of death. So anyway, these things help me. But how exactly they help me or whatever, it just never seems to stop the cycle, the Sampra, the jaws of the crocodile you know, biting again and again and again. And that's cool. I mean, maybe I never make it. Uh, I never have what Weber says where it just like blows out like the candle or whatever. But I sure am enjoying the the, the battle. Um, but yeah. Anyway, Schwartz, he, James Schwartz, he says, you're dreaming if you ever, like, he, he's where I get this term me too from. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, if you, if you think the ego is ever going to die, you're dreaming. I mean, as long as there's a meat tube, there's always an ego. And, and you know, I think that's probably going to prove true. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, you got, you got to kind of learn to love, love the thing and laugh at it, but it certainly is not without its sting. Well, Anthony, this has been such a fascinating conversation. Thank you. We may have to do another one about language and language learning. We, so tentatively planned. That was our third item. We tentatively had to cover the day and we didn't. You have a very interesting approach to that. And you do speak uh, several languages and you have an uh, interesting approach to learning them and engaging with them and you know, grammar, vocabulary, all that sort of thing. Uh, uh, so I would really like to uh, quiz you a bit about that and, and understand your approach. So perhaps next time, where can people find out more about particularly your memory techniques? You've mentioned Victorious Mind, your book. Mm -hmm. um, where else can people find out? You've mentioned your cohorts. Uh, if they would like to find out more about this or perhaps even study with you, where could they do so? Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. The The mothership is magneticmerrymethod.com. And I think if you just put in Anthony and memory, I'll, I'll probably come up on the search engines. And yeah, magneticmerrymethod.com is, is the website. And there's a free course there. So, you know, you can try these things out, try them on for size. It's another version of what we talked about today. And there's some worksheets that you can fill out and so forth that help you develop memory palaces uh, and yeah that, that, that's that's where where i hang out and blogging all the time really it's just like how far can we push the free line that's the that's the main emphasis of the project and treat it like a university i don't have as many guests on as i used to but pretty much everybody who will talk to me if you don't like the way i talk about it there's other memory experts and memory teachers on the podcast uh, dozens of them. So there's uh, lots to explore. Anthony Mativier, thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.